All right. Have you had a nice day today? Yes. Have you? Yes. Been a good day? You know, I was just going to ask you, are, are we friends? Yes. Are we? Okay, good. Because I need you to pray for me. I have this strange nose thing going on. And I, I'm not talking about the size of my nose. <laughs> I, I know some of you had already maybe thought that. Um, I have this... Uh, stuffiness going, I might be allergic to Canada, I don't know what it is, because I never get this in the States. And uh, last night, if you heard me preaching, I, and praise the Lord, and Jesus, I, I just, I want to be done with this. I was tired all day today, and uh, anyway, would you pray for me tonight that I will be 100% tomorrow? Would you do that? I said, would you do that? Yeah, yeah. okay, good, good. Um, I'm looking forward to tonight's message. It's our second message in the series entitled For, For Faith. Now, by a raising of hands, how many of you were not with us last night? Oh, that's really too bad, isn't it, guys? Really too bad. You'll have to get the DVD. And uh, I think we had a good message last night. What do you think? I think it was clear, and I hope it was compelling. And we're going to continue right along those same lines this evening. Again, we're examining the four central elements of the Christian faith. Last night, Revelation, tonight, Resurrection, tomorrow night, or tomorrow evening, Redemption, and then we'll look at Restoration. I'm really looking forward to tonight's message for a variety of reasons, and I'll probably get into those after we pray. Uh, so let's do that. Let's commence with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you to thank you that you are the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As we learned last night, Father, you are more than an abstraction, than an ideology or even a theology. Father, you invite us through the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, to enter into not just a relationship with you, but friendship with you. And so, Father, as we commence and continue this series, we ask that your Spirit will be with us. Guide our minds, open our hearts, and speak to us through the pages of Scripture. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Let all God's friends say, Amen. Amen. So the four central elements of the Christian faith, revelation, that is the revealing of God, resurrection, redemption, and restoration. And we're proposing in this series four for faith, that the four central elements of the Christian faith present the most compelling and truthful answer. I want to hone in on that truthful answer. We just spoke about that briefly last evening, but again, when we're talking about the Christian faith, we are not talking about a preference. We're talking about something that we believe, I believe, to be true. That is to say, if no one believed that it was true, it would still be true. Do you understand the difference there, yes or no? We're not talking about what's the best color, blue or green, and that's up for a vote or, or that is a matter of subjective opinion. We're talking about what is true in the ultimate sense. And I'm maintaining in this series, and I imagine some of you would agree, some of you may wonder, but I'm going to maintain in this series that the Christian truth or the Christian faith provides the most compelling, cohesive, and internally consistent answer to the four central questions of the human experience. Origin, where am I from? Meaning, why am I here? Morality, how should I live? And destiny, where am I going, if anywhere? There's not a culture, there's not a person, there's not a language group, there's not a socioeconomic strata that does not have to engage these four questions. Where am I from? And of course, that's, that's going to be a determinative question for the rest of the following questions. Where I'm from will have a determinative effect on what I think about why I'm here and, and how I should live and where, if anywhere, I'm going. So what we're going to do this evening is, is move from the revelation of God to the resurrection of God. I think last night, and as much as we could in an hour, uh, present a compelling case for the existence of God. And we looked at five lines of evidence. How many lines of evidence, everyone? Five. What was our first word that we looked at last night? Time. time. That's right. And we learned last night that time cannot, by definition, extend infinitely into the past, because if it extends infinitely into the past, it could have never gotten started for us to arrive at today. But here we are at today, which is proof positive, prima facie evidence, that time must have had a beginning. 
But if time has a beginning, it must have a what? Beginner. This is not only philosophically sound, it's scientifically sound, and the expansion of the universe, what is sometimes called the Big Bang cosmological theory, supports this. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to buy into all of the baggage of the Big Bang uh, cosmological theorem, but we can at least say the universe is not static, it's not infinite, it is in fact expanding, and nothing that is expanding can be infinite. What would it extend into if in fact it was infinite? The second word was what that we looked at last night? Life, and we learned that life is in Christ. Remember those four marvelous words? John chapter 1 and verse 4. In, see if you can say it with me. In Him was life. And we learned that the cosmological anthropological principle basically says that the universe had to be exactly the way it is in order to permit life at all. As cosmologists and scientists and others survey the measurable characteristics of the universe, the startling conclusion arrests the attention that goes something like this. The universe appears to have had man in mind. If you take even one of those measurable characteristics and move it just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percentage, life becomes impossible, not just here on planet Earth, but anywhere in the universe. And so the very existence of life, this is sometimes referred to as the law of biogenesis. Biogenesis is the juxtaposition of two words, bios, which is life, and genesis, which is beginning. Biogenesis. And we, we know that life only comes from life. It's medieval thinking that if you put trash in the corner and, and you put r rubbish in the corner and refuse in the corner, that eventually rats and maggots and mice will spontaneously begin to exist in that pot. That is medieval thinking. Among others, a man by the name of Louis Pasteur performed a series of, of very simple scientific experiments whereby he established that the reason that the rats and the mice and the maggots are in the pile is because they crawled in when you weren't looking. And we know now that, that life only comes from life. But, but remember the two kinds of universes. Over here we have a naturalistic universe that is only matter and energy. And over here we have a, a supernatural universe where God is involved. But over here, if all we have is matter and energy, we have to violate the scientific principle, uh, some would say law, of biogenesis at the outset. In this universe, if God doesn't exist, then somehow we have to get life from non-life. Where, pray tell, does life come from? Well, it comes from, from the, the, the coming together of certain chemical elements and amino acids that was struck. That's all fine and good, but let's understand something. That takes faith. That takes what did I say, everyone? Faith. faith. And people that are rigid in their methodological naturalism, that is that it is only matter and energy, must concede that at the very root of their belief system is a decidedly non-scientific belief, and that is that life spontaneously generated from non-living things. And so we look at life. And we conclude that if life begets life, here Christianity is infinitely more scientific than any naturalistic, atheistic explanation because the Christian religion posits a living beginning. Are we on the same page, yes or no? God says, I created the world. I formed it to be inhabited. So time, life. What was the next one? Mind. Mind. There's a difference between your brain and your mind. Your brain is a physical organ. It's measurable, it's weighable, it's quantifiable, but your mind is not this. How in, an, in a universe in which God doesn't exist, in which there is only matter and energy, how can you have an immaterial mind? Another way to think about this is imagine I had a chalkboard here and I wrote the number seven on it. And I ask you a question, is that the number seven? What would you say? What would you say, yes or no? And you'd all be wrong. That's not the number seven. Because what happens if I erase the number seven? What happens now? Do we count one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, eleven? That's a numeral. It's a what, everyone? It's a numeral. It's a symbol that represents something called seven. You've never been looking under your bed for that watch that you lost or that shoe that you lost and said, oh, that, no. Oh, but there's the number seven under there. Let me grab that. You've never opened up your closet and, and a bunch of stuff came falling out and the number seven hit you on the head. 
You've never been walking down the street and, oh, you tripped. Oh, did I tri- oh it's the number seven. I've need- There's probably a mathematics department somewhere that's looking for this. <laughs> Numbers are immaterial entities, Right? They're not extended in space. The mind is an immaterial entity. Incidentally, a strictly, the, a strictly atheistic, naturalistic philosopher maintains amazingly that numbers don't exist. Truly. And that your mind doesn't exist. Well, why would he maintain something that's so irrational and so inconsistent with human experience? Because he has to. You cannot have immaterial objects in a materialistic universe. If that makes sense, say amen. So then we ask the question, well, where in the world did this mind come from? Where did this immaterial mind come from? The best explanation is that God, as the first immaterial mind, made rational minds. Are we all on the same page there? Some people say, well, I've never seen God, so I don't believe in Him. Well, you've never seen your mind either, and yet you believe you have a mind. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that you believe everyone in this room has a mind, and yet you've never seen a single mind in your entire existence. Are we comfortable with this, everyone, yes or no? See, sometimes people know just enough to be dangerous. And people raise these ridiculous objections to the Christian faith, and because we don't know the answers, we think there aren't any answers. I remember the first time I went to algebra class, I was, I don't know, what grade is that? Eighth grade, seventh grade, ninth grade? And I went in and I sat down, and the, the, the professor did a strange thing. He wrote on the board, X plus Y equals 17. And I remember thinking when I first saw that, the professor has lost his mind. <laughs> X is, an, X is, X is a, a, a member of the alphabet. It's a letter. What does he mean X plus Y equals 17? Now, don't miss this. Don't miss this. I was sitting in algebra class and I didn't know. But the fact that I didn't know didn't mean that there wasn't a good explanation. And sometimes people present these objections to the Christian faith and we cower before them as though there's no answer. And be honest with you. How many of you can honestly heed the admonition of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to any man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Somebody says, well, I've never seen God, so I don't know how God exists. And we say, oh, oh. Beloved, there are powerful, biblical, philosophical, cogent, rational answers to these objections, and I think that Christians should know them. Amen. Hey, listen, you're going to go study with a Baptist. Now, I'm, I'm, this is not on the notes. This is, I'm way off, so just anticipate another long sermon. You go study with a Baptist, and he says Sunday's the Sabbath, and you say Saturday's the Sabbath. Hey, good for you. You can open the Bible and show them that Saturday's the Sabbath. Amen. Someone say amen. amen. But listen, what if somebody doesn't believe the Bible? What do you say then? Uh, okay, well, it's good to see you. <laughs> what if somebody says, well, why shouldn't I be a Muslim? What if someone says, how do you know Christianity is true? I asked a Mormon that one time. And by the way, there is a great deal to admire in the Mormon church, the way that they, if you want to call it a church, the way that they go out door to door and the way that they, they almost enlist their young people in ministry. I, we should be looking at what these guys are doing, but their theology is bankrupt. I remember one time a Mormon came to my door and we engaged one another in conversation. I suppose it lasted an hour and a half long. And, and finally, when it, when it boiled down to it, he said, here, take the Book of Mormon and pray and God will give you a burning in your bosom that it's true. And I remember thinking, are you for real? <laughs> I mean, you, you, you're kidding, right? You want me to take this book and hold it and say, if this book is true, let me feel heartburn? <laughs> now, beloved, we can kind of laugh at that, but the reality is, is that for many people, Mormons and Christians, their religious experience is little more than fi- feelings. Beloved, listen to me. There are good answers to the difficult questions, and let's not pretend that there are not difficult questions. But shame on us if we don't know at least the beginnings of the answers to some of those difficult questions. Someone ought to say amen. 
And so we looked at the mind. And then what was our fourth word there? Do you remember? Ought. And ought implies a moral imperative, but a moral imperative demands a moral reference point, but a moral reference point demands a moral law giver. If God doesn't exist, beloved, there is no difference between someone saying, I prefer to torture children and I prefer the color blue. There is no substantive difference. But you don't believe that. And even atheists don't believe that. Even atheists believe that certain things are wrong. I read you that that, that quotation last night from John Healy, the director of Amnesty International. We believe that certain things are wrong, but you can't say that unless there is a transcendent anchor that tells us what is right and what is wrong. Because if that doesn't exist, it simply might makes right. And Adolf Hitler can be right if he's in power or someone else if they're in power. Ought. And then last but not least friend. Mark Twain said 99% of what men believe, they believe on the authority of another. And yet this will never do when it comes to a relationship with God. Beloved, David Asterix's relationship with God is not going to get you to heaven. And your relationship with God is not going to get me to heaven. We have to have our own relationship, experience, and friendship with God in heaven. Can someone say amen? amen? And God invites us into that. Jesus says, I'm not going to call you servants anymore. I will call you friends. God says, come, let us reason together. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. God invites us into a relationship, into an experience with Him, and we can know for ourselves with absolute confidence that God exists because we have an experience with Him. But you will notice that I put the experience at the tail end. Not because it's the least important, but because, beloved, if you have an experience that is not consistent with reality, I don't care about your experience. I don't want it. They take people who have experiences that are not consistent with reality and they put them in mental institutions. Are you with me? So someone might feel they have an experience with someone. Someone, someone could say, this, this tree spoke to me today. <laughs> and I am now a devotee of the plastic tree at Deer Lodge. That's not consistent with reality. What evidences can you put forward to demonstrate that someone else should give their devotion to said tree? The great thing about the Christian faith is that it is not only experientially compelling, but it's true. And the Christian faith rises or falls on the resurrection. God is alive. He is real. He exists. There are good reasons to believe this. There is abundant evidence which supports this conclusion, yet faith is still necessary. We talked last night that faith is based on what, everyone? Evidence. It's not a blind faith, but an intelligent faith, which is supported by evidence. You've got it. Last night our message was, God, are you there? Do you care? The answer is yes, a resounding yes. Tonight, the Word, alive and kicking. That's a colloquial saying. Alive and kicking, it means vigorous, ready to go. Let's, let's get the game on. Alive and kicking. The word alive and kicking. The Christian claim is that God has revealed Himself in the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God, who is one with God. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 30, see if you can say it with me. I and my Father are one. Let's say it together again. I and my Father are one. That's a remarkable claim. That is the claim of Orthodox Christianity that Jesus is one with God and that He is God. Jesus, as God, was uniquely qualified to reveal God. We use the term incarnate. How many of you have heard the term incarnation before? Incarnation. It comes from the the Latin word carne. Our Spanish-speaking peoples tonight know what the word carne means. It means flesh or meat. And so when we talk about the incarnation, what we're literally saying is it's the infleshing of God. Now you asked me to explain it. I can't. How can you explain that the illimitable God of the universe took a form as a man? It's not explainable, but it's believable. It doesn't violate the principles of rationality, but it surely transcends what we perceive to be rationality. And so God becomes a man. That's the Christian claim. Now, beloved, listen to me. That claim is either true or false. Are you on the same page with me, yes or no? If that claim is true, Christianity is true. If that claim is false, Christianity is false. 
Well, how would we go about knowing then? How, how would we go about knowing if, in fact, Jesus was who he claimed to be. There are many texts, many, many texts in the New Testament. I've given you just some of them here. We're not going to look at all of them. You're familiar with John chapter 14, verse 9. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so here the Word, the Logos, is Christ. In verse 14, it says that the Word was made flesh. It's the incarnation. That's the Christian teaching. That this man, Jesus, was not just a religious guru. He wasn't just a sublime philosopher, but, but that he was God in flesh. And I want to say it again because many of us have not thought this through critically. If that claim is true, Christianity is true. And if that claim is false, Christianity is false. Look in Luke chapter 9, our last verse there. Luke chapter 9, that's the third book of the New Testament. You have your Bibles there in front of you. Luke chapter 9 and verse 18. Notice this with me. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him. And he said to them, who do the crowds say that I am? He's taking a public opinion survey. I'm curious what others are saying about me and my identity and my mission. So he asked his disciples, hey, what's the word on the streets, fellas? What are, what are people saying about me? Verse 19, so they answered and said, well, some say you're John the Baptist and some say Elijah and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. Jesus says, I'm satisfied that you have given me an accurate representation of public opinion. But then he says in verse 20, but who do you say that I am? Beloved, dare I say it, that that is the question. Who do you say I am? Peter speaks up on behalf of the rest of the apostles and he says, I love this in the old Elizabethan English of the King James, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. In the Greek, Christ is Christos, it's the Messiah, it's the Mashiach, it's the anointed one. You are the Messiah, God's Son. Now, beloved, I, I just want to say it again because it, it, it will come into your mind, hopefully, and, and make an impression that Peter's statement is either true or false. We must reject these ridiculous, relativistic, pluralistic ideas that say that something can be true and false in the same way at the same time. If I'm walking with my wife on the beach and, and, uh, and you've heard that, that she's pregnant and you come up and say, oh, so Pastor Asher, this is your wife. Oh, so nice to meet you. Vi. I hear you're expecting. And I say yes and she says no at the same time. Yes, no. You don't say, oh, well, that's so wonderful. This develops in your mind what's called cognitive dissonance. You're going to say, well, wait, 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 which is it? And maybe he hasn't told her or, or uh, <laughs> sweetie, you're pregnant. And you know, you laugh at that. But both times my wife was pregnant, I told her. Both times, true story. I said to her, sweetie, you're pregnant. She said, I'm not pregnant. I said, you're pregnant. I can tell. You look pregnant to me. <clears throat> Not in a bad way. Listen, let me tell you something else. I'm not going to settle for that. When my wife was nine months big, she was beautiful to me. In fact, I, I tell her, I say, sweetie, you look so cute. I just, I took pictures of her at every angle and, and I, she was so beautiful. I just could tell she was pregnant. She went and got a pregnancy test. Pregnant. I said, yes. She was happy. But then... Nine months later, I said, sweetie, you're pregnant. <laughs> I'm not pregnant. You're pregnant. No, she went to the market there and bought a pregnancy test, the two-for-one deal. You know, you get the one, you get the two, because it's 99.8 or 99.6, but if you get two, then I suppose it would be like 99.7. She took one, pregnant, two, pregnant, went and bought another box of two, right? So now we're at 99.6.7. She took another one, 99.8. She took another one, 99.9. I said, you're pregnant. She said, I'm pregnant. <laughs> now, now, now back, to the, back to the point here. It can't be true that she is and isn't pregnant in the same way at the same time. But that's what relativism and pluralism teaches. It's so irrational. And someone says one plus one is two, and someone else says one plus one is three, and someone else says one plus one is four. And because we don't want to upset anyone, we say we're all right. That's called pluralism. And pluralism is ridiculous. I don't know how it is in the Canadian school system, but I can tell you this. 
in the United States, when I, when I went to school, teachers had guts. I can remember numerous occasions where uh, <laughs> it was really kind of humiliating at times. They'd say, uh, okay, we're going to do these problems on the board. And uh, we'd like to, uh, who, who'd like to come up and do this, this math problem? And just, mm, mm, of course, the smart kids are like, mm, mm, me. But then, mm, David. Mm, mm, mm. You get up there, you know, and it's nine plus nine. You're just a little child, and you're thinking, nine plus nine, is it 70, nine times nine? 72? Yes, 70, 81. Da, da, da. Mm. 72. And the teacher says, wrong! <laughs> in this day and age, they don't do that anymore. You say nine times nine, and you put 72, and they say, uh, well, that's another way of looking at it. <laughs> you know, David, I want to affirm you in your unique perspective on nine times nine. You can sit down. Are you with me, yes or no? Now, now, beloved, we kind of chuckle at this, but the reality is, is that this same kind of thinking has crept into the most basic philosophical questions about life. I mean, friends, either God exists or He doesn't. He can't exist and not exist at the same time. Jesus claimed to be the, the Messiah. The, the disciples claimed that He was the Messiah. That, that claim is either true or it's false. So Jesus says, who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now notice verse 21. And he strictly warned them and commanded them to tell no one. Verse 22, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, no, notice this now, and be killed and be raised the third day. Now at this point in, in the ministry of Jesus and in the, the experience with the disciples, this just went like, whew, right over the head. They were totally unprepared for that. Because when they signed up for the Messiah Club, they signed up to reign over the Romans, not to follow a guy that gets nailed to a cross. Are you with me, yes or no? And so sometimes we have selective hearing. Are you with me? So you have a date and you remember the date. Like, oh yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm going out with Christine on, at 7 o'clock on Friday. You don't forget that. But your dentist appointment, you forgot. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's right. My dentist appointment was yesterday. How come we forget certain things and remember others? Because the things that we forget, we don't want to remember. And Jesus says, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. You've got it right. And this is the essence of what I must do. He says, the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to die. He's going to be buried. And then he's going to be raised from the dead. And the disciples didn't hear any of it. Jesus here ties his identity and his mission and his claim to his resurrection. How do we know if Jesus' claim is true? For me, it's simple. The death, burial, and especially the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. It is the pinnacle of God's revelation of himself to mankind. G.B. Hardy said in his book, Countdown, there are only two essential questions. Number one, has anyone ever cheated death? And number two, is it available to me? There are only two essential questions. Number one, has anyone ever cheated death? And number two, is it available to me? He said, let us survey the historical record. Buddha's tomb occupied. Confucius' tomb occupied. Muhammad's tomb occupied. Jesus' tomb empty. And then G.B. Hardy adds, and he's not being pejorative when he says this. When he says this, he says, argue as you will, but for me and my purposes, there's no point in following a loser. Now, when he uses the term loser, he's not using like we would use it today, like he's a loser. What he's saying is, is that every one of us has to eventually come up against this great enemy called death, and man after man after man after man is losing the battle, losing the battle, losing the battle, losing the battle, and here, standing alone on the landscape of human history is a man, or at least a man who claims, and his disciples claimed, that he overcame this great universal enemy called death. Now, beloved, if I didn't know anything else, I'm interested. How about you? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, I, even if that was all I knew, I'd say, I'm interested in what this guy has to say. I'm one of these people that enjoys life. Anybody else like that in here? You preach at some of these churches and they're filled with sad Venists. <laughs> Mad Venists. 
instead of Gladvenists. <laughs> Drives me to utter distraction when you ask someone how they're doing and they say, fine. Fine? What is that? Fine. Fine is a texture, beloved. Fine is not an attitude. Fine is not, fine is not a frame of mind. That's like saying, how are you doing? I'm doing corduroy. <laughs> I'm doing coarse. No, 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 no. Beloved, if you're a Christian, you could have had the worst day and you still have a Savior. Amen. Hallelujah, beloved. I feel like saying, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Jesus Christ is interceding on your behalf right now in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and you're doing fine? Come on. A good friend of mine likes to say, when you ask him how he's doing, he says, fantastic. But don't worry, things will get better. <laughs> Are you with me? I hope so. I'm one of these people that enjoys life, and, and frankly, I, I'm not looking forward to death. I saw a t-shirt one time that said, it's not that life is so short, but that death is so long. So you look at the landscape of human history, and there is a lone figure. Millions, yea, billions of deaths. And here's a lone figure victory over death. G.B. Hardy says there are only two essential questions. Number one, has anyone cheated death? And number two, is it available to me? And the Christian claim is that Jesus as incarnate God has overcome death by his resurrection and then he makes it available to me. Now I want to know if that claim is true. Can someone say amen? I don't want to just accept it glibly because my mom believed it or my dad believed it or because you believe it or because Dick O'Phil believes it or Jeffrey believes it. I want to know if that claim is true. And if it's true, the world needs to hear it. Because I'm going to venture a guess that the rest of the world dislikes death as much as you. Are you with me? I hope so. So here we go. Let's talk about the resurrection. Is there any good reason to believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead? Is there any good historical reason to believe that? I think there is. The resurrection of Jesus acquires such decisive meaning. This is from Wolfhart Pannenberg, New Testament scholar. Not merely because someone or anyone has been raised from the dead, but because it was Jesus of Nazareth whose execution was instigated by the Jews because, uh, by the Jews because he had blasphemed against God. If this man was raised from the dead, then that plainly means that the God whom he had supposedly blasphemed had committed himself to him. The resurrection can only be understood as the divine vindication of the man whom the Jews had rejected as a blasphemer. Do you see his point, yes or no? It's not just that someone was resurrected from the dead, but that it was this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, who claimed to be the Messiah. Now that is important. Now again, I don't want to know just if it's theologically compelling or all of those kinds of things. I want to know if it's true. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in fact, let's look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's go there. You're in Luke. Forward just a bit. 1 Corinthians, Acts, Romans. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What chapter, everyone? 15, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you and which you also received and in which you stand, by which you are saved. Notice you're saved by the gospel. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you have believed in vain. Paul says, hang on to the gospel. The gospel I preached, hang on to it because it's going to save you. Jesus himself said, He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. Here it is. Colon. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. Colon. Here it is. This is what Paul learned and this is what he passed on. Here's the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Can someone say amen? amen. And that he was buried. Can someone say amen? amen? And that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Can someone say amen? amen? And that he was seen by Cephas and after that by the twelve. And after that by over five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, by the rest of the apostles. And last of all he was seen by me as one born out of due time. So Paul says, hey, when I was with you I preached the gospel. And then Paul defines the gospel for us. Oh, beloved, the gospel is so simple. Sometimes we get hung up and we go, oh, what is the gospel and, and whose version of the gospel should I believe? Is it Pastor A, Pastor B, Pastor C, or Pastor D? And sometimes they're saying non-complimentary things. Beloved, don't get caught up in, in this ministry or that ministry as opposed to another. The gospel is so simple. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Amen. That is the gospel. That's what Paul calls the gospel. 
And surely we can expand on that theme, but don't ever lose your simplicity in Christ. Wasn't it Jesus that said, ah, you guys, you're not getting it unless you become as aged, wise scholars, unless you become as little children. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now notice, Paul says some fascinating things here. Look at verse 12. He's writing to the church at Corinth and he says, Now if Christ is preached that he had been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And Paul was a logical man. Verse 13, he was trained classically. He was, a, he was a, trained in a Greek city, the city of Tarsus. He was a logical person. There's nothing wrong with being logical and being a Christian, hardly. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Well, that makes sense. Verse 14, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified that God raised him up, Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. See how logical he is. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. I would substitute the word silly. Your faith is silly. You are still in your sins. Then also we, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, have perished. In other words, it's game over. No resurrection. If Christ hasn't raised from the dead, they're not coming out of that grave. The Christian teaching is that we can come out of the grave because Christ came out of the grave and we put faith in what Christ has done. Paul says, hey, listen, if, if Christ didn't come out of the grave, then your, your husband's not coming out of that grave either. And neither are your kids. I had to bury my two nephews last year. Ages five and eight killed in a car accident with their grandmother. The only thing that enabled those parents to get through was their confidence that they're going to see those boys again. But don't miss what Paul's saying. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, you won't see those boys again. Are you hearing me, yes or no? So the Christian faith hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. I'll spell it in plain, plain, plain language. Christianity hinges on the claims of Jesus and the claims of Jesus hinge on His vindication which hinge on His resurrection. If Jesus is raised, His claims are likely true, some would say certainly true, and the Christian faith is true. I don't mean preferential. I don't mean fun for me. What I mean is true. So I'm going to maintain this evening that Jesus is alive. I've got a good friend. His name is Pastor Jason Sieber. Wonderful man. Anyone in this room know Jason? You know him? I mean, the guy is, is a polymath. You know what that is? A polymath is someone who has an encyclopedic recollection of certain things. You ask him about anything in history and he can repeat it just like that. The guy's a genius. Well, he, he, he'd get a big head if I said that. Jason, I take that back. You're not a genius. You're just very smart. The guy's brilliant. And uh, he, was, he was studying journalism. You know what his aspiration was? He wanted to be the president of the United States of America. Literally. And he's just the kind of boy that could have done it. Brilliant. Confident. Charismatic. Intelligent. And uh, he was studying at Humboldt State University. There was a Baptist preacher that would stand on the corner of Humboldt State University. And if you know anything about Humboldt State University, that's Northern California. That's where they grow all the marijuana out in Humboldt, okay? Like it is liberal par excellence, okay? And, and, and Jay, but it's also a well-known school academically. And Jason's going to the school and he has ambitions of being the president of the United States of America or at least he would settle for maybe secretary of state. And there's a preacher standing on the corner there, just some simple, humble Baptist preacher. He told me his name. I wish I could remember it. And this Baptist preacher would preach, and he, he was so simple. He would, he would just, so, so simple, and, and crowds would gather around him hardly to listen, mostly to mock. And Jason said one day he went to hear that preacher. He's walking, you know, through campus. Here he is studying. <laughs> He's not a Christian. And he stops to listen to this preacher to make fun of him. And he said, that preacher said three words. And when he said those three words, even in my ambitious condition, my godless condition, those three words penetrated my heart. You know what those three words were? That preacher said it over and over again. Jesus is alive. 
Jesus is alive. Now, beloved, if that's true, then we all should be shouting hallelujah. I'm going to maintain this evening that it is. When I say Jesus is alive, I'm going to maintain that this is more than theologically foundational. I'm not just saying we need this in order for us to continue to have conferences like this because without it, it would be hard to have a Christian conference. What I'm saying is it's historically factual, and I'm going to give you four reasons to believe that tonight. We're going to look at feet. That's not feet like on the bottom of your legs. That's feet like a great feat. He accomplished a, a marvelous feat, F-E-A-T. And feet stands for these four things, fatal torment, empty tomb, appearances and testimonies of the church. We're going to look at four historical facts. Four historical, what did I say, everyone? Facts. We're not going to look at David's feelings. We're not going to be Mormons tonight and say, I feel that Jesus rose from the dead in my bosom. Perhaps you just ate too much uh, for lunch. We're not, we're, not, we're not going to trust that. We're going to ask the question, is, is this credible? Are we allowed to believe that? Or do we have to check our brains at the door? I mean, I've never seen anyone raised from the dead. Though I've, I've uh, talked to a couple AFM missionaries that have seen it, believe it or not. God is still raising people from the dead. Here we go. Fatal torment. I'm going to give you six lines of evidences here, and they're very simple. Six lines of evidence. Number one, the tomb location in which Jesus was buried was known. The tomb location was known. We're looking at fatal torment. Did Jesus actually die? Was the tomb actually empty? The tomb location was known. It was a well-established tomb location. In fact, we even know about the owner of the tomb, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. The idea of the resurrection of Jesus is rooted in early Christianity. In fact, there are documents as early as 40 A.D., this idea that, 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 that Jesus was raised from the dead is not something that, that was a later legendary development. The idea of the resurrection is something that was, that was inherent to early what we might call apostolic Christianity. Now let's think about that for just a moment. When legends get started, it takes time. The reason that legends take time to develop is that people are around to disprove the legends. You with me on that? So if the legend was that, that uh, you flew a hundred feet unaided by any sort of mechanical or aeronautical device, you just flapped your wings and flew, a legend could begin to develop around that, but not in your neighborhood and not with your parents and certainly not in this day and age. It would take some time. All of the witnesses would have to be gone, and then the legend could begin small. And then after generation after generation, just like the telephone game you used to play perhaps when you were a child, you whisper into the ear, pss, pss, and then it goes around, 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 around. And when it gets back, it doesn't sound anything like the initial statement. It takes generations for these legends to develop. But here's the point. The idea of the resurrection was rooted in early Christianity from the first century. Now, that would have been when it would have been easiest to disprove. It's not like someone thought up in the third century, you know, how about that Jesus of Nazareth guy? Maybe he was resurrected. People were believing that this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, was resurrected within five years. It's, it's, there are documents that testify that this was a belief of early Christianity. And incidentally, you just read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which was written, I'm going to guess, around 60. I should know that right off the top of my head. Maybe 62, 63 AD. And Paul says, I'm telling you what was told to me that Christ rose from the dead. So you know that that can't be any later than... 20 or 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus, and so there's no time for a legend to develop. Number three, Joseph of, Joseph of Arimathea would not have been invented. You know how it is when you tell a lie. Remember how you used to tell lies to your parents, and, and the more vague you were about the lies, the, the better chances you had of getting away with it. You know what I'm talking about? So your mom would say, well, where were you all afternoon? Oh, I was out. Where? Where? I was at Jimmy's. Oh, you were at Jimmy's this afternoon. Yeah, yeah, I was at Jimmy's this afternoon. I was, uh, I was uh, playing with his um, sister. Oh, really? Jimmy doesn't have a sister. Oh, th did I say sister? I meant I was playing with his friends. Jimmy doesn't have any friends. Are you with me? The, the, the more details you add to the lie, you, before you know it, you're like, ah, I'm caught. 
Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin Council. The Sanhedrin Council was the most powerful council in Jerusalem, consisted of 70 members. There were well-known documents who's on the council. It, it would be like saying uh, there's some special council in the United States, maybe senator or in Canada. Y you would say this person owned the tomb. Oh, come on. You wouldn't invent that kind of a detail because it could have been so easily checked in the first century. Joseph of who? That is cute. There is no Joseph of Arimathea. And he's not a member of the Sanhedrin Council. You wouldn't invent those kinds of specific details if you were trying to create a general lie. It could have been checked out very easily. Make sense, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, so the tomb location was known. The tomb location was discovered empty by ladies in all of the gospel accounts. It is likely that Mary and her compatriots were the first there to the tomb. It's always ladies. Now, beloved, I, I, I hate to inform you of this, and, and I'm so glad it isn't this way anymore, but, but in Jesus' day, women occupied a low place on the, the social ladder. In, in fact, uh, in, in a traditional rabbinical court, women could not serve as legal witnesses. Right? You with me on that? So, so if someone had actually been murdered and a woman saw it, they would say her testimony is invalid. You know, she's an unstable woman. It's true. Now think about this for just... I'm not... I don't believe that for a second, but I'll tell you this, beloved. That's, that's the climate of first century... Uh, the first century culture, and yet all the gospel accounts have women finding the tomb. Now, if you were going to invent this story, you would not have ladies finding the tomb. Are we on the same page? Yes or no? You'd have Peter finding the tomb empty, or, or perhaps James or John. You wouldn't have had ladies finding the tomb open because it would undermine the credibility of your story right at the outset. But the fact that the early church recorded this in unabashed, unashamed detail strongly suggests that it was, in fact, true. In fact, this is one of the great tests of historical authenticity are elements of what is called embarrassment recorded. And this would have been a, a, a point of potential embarrassment for the early church, and yet they stood by it with absolute resolution. It was discovered empty by the ladies, and they wrote it. Number five, the preaching begins in Jerusalem. It doesn't begin in some small city in Asia Minor. The preaching of Christ risen begins right in Jerusalem. Well, that would have been the place where it would have been easiest to disprove all you would have had to do is go exhume the body and say, all right, grab him, all right, gra okay, got him, all right. Parade his body through the streets of Jerusalem and say, he's what? Christianity would have evaporated in a moment as the dew evaporates before the rising sun. The fact that the, 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 the truth of the risen Savior begins and has its origins in Jerusalem strongly suggests that it's true. That would be the toughest place for it to begin. It would have been so easily checked out. And, and the nail in the coffin, pun intended, is number six. The earliest Jewish arguments against the resurrection presuppose that the tomb was empty. Look at Matthew chapter 28. You've got Matthew there, don't you? Look at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 11. Matthew chapter 28 and what verse, everyone? Verse 11. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we what? Slept. Verse 14, And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. In other words, we'll protect you. Verse 15, So they took the money and did as they were instructed and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day now think about it the gospel of Matthew was authored likely in 70 AD Jesus crucifixion and, and his death and his burial took place in 31 AD this is almost 40 years later and Matthew's writing that when the Jews combated the resurrection their answer was the disciples stole the what the body. Beloved, the earliest Jewish arguments against the resurrection presupposed that the tomb was empty. Are you with me on that, yes or no? And the fact that Matthew would say 40 years later that this is what they're still saying is proof positive that the reason they couldn't shut Christianity down so quickly was because there was no body to disprove it. 
Now, this does not in and of itself prove that Jesus was raised, but at least it gets us heading in that direction. The tomb location was known. This belief was rooted in the early church. It was not a later legend that was developed. Joseph of Arimathea would not have been invented. The tomb was discovered, by empty, was discovered empty by women. This was a point of potential embarrassment for the early church, and yet they proclaimed it with power and conviction. All of the gospel accounts teach that. Number five, the preaching began in Jerusalem, the very place where it would have been most difficult for that very doctrine to arise, the resurrection. And number six, even the earliest Jewish arguments against the resurrection say, well, the tomb is empty, but here's our alternate explanation as to why. And so we go back to feet. Jesus did, in fact, die. There is, in fact, an empty tomb. Now, that doesn't prove the resurrection. Can you say amen? It just doesn't. There are a variety, a multiplicity of other options, and we'll look at some of them. The disciples had nothing to gain by lying and starting a new religion. This is J.P. Moreland. They faced hardship, ridicule, hostility, and martyrs' deaths. In light of this, they could have never sustained such unwavering motivation if they knew what they were preaching was a what? Lie. Beloved, go look at the record of the disciples, except for Judas, every one of them died a martyr's death. Now you're saying, no, 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 John didn't die a martyr's death. It's true that he didn't die a martyr's death, but he was thrown into a pot of boiling oil by the Roman emperor Domitian. So the fact that he didn't die is academic, right? The fact that he lived was just academic. He was willing to go through with it. Now just think about it for a moment here. Your head is on the block and you know you hid the body in the woods. That executioner with that big stereotypical black mask who looks a little bit like Travis in terms of size. <laughs> He's quite a handsome guy. That's why you don't know what those guys look like. Oh, they have a black mask. And he comes up and says, You sure you believe in Jesus? You sure he raised from the dead? Now you know the thing is a hoax. You're not going through with it. No one would willingly die for what they knew was a lie, much less 11 people. Are you with me, yes or no? That's what he's saying. What did they have to gain by starting this story? The disciples were not fools, and Paul was a cool-headed intellectual of the first rank. There would have been several opportunities over three to four decades of ministry to reconsider and renounce the lie, and yet they all stood by it even to the death. I personally believe that God allowed the disciples to die those martyrs' death to be the seal on their confidence in the Christ and in His resurrection. So, 2,000 years ago, a tomb in Nazareth turned up empty. In the last 2,000 years, there have been alternate explanations offered by liberal scholars. <laughs> Beloved, you are looking at the very best. I have researched this subject. I invite you to do the same. As you look at that screen, you are looking at the very, very best that liberal scholarship has to offer as alternate explanations because very few people take issue with the historical Christ, though some. And those that, that at least concede the historical Christ do believe he died and they do believe the tomb is empty. So now you have facts, not feelings, but facts. You have a man that claimed to be God who died and you have a tomb that's empty. Well, guess what? We better explain it. And so you have liberals that have come up with alternate explanations. And so what we want to look at tonight is do any of these have explanatory scope? That is, are they believable? This is the very best that liberal scholarship has done in 2,000 years. Number one, the conspiracy theory. The disciples made it up. This is morally improbable. It's psychologically improbable for at least the following reasons. Number one, the disciples were in no frame of mind to be inventing conspiracy theories. John chapter 20 records that they were hiding in a closet because they were afraid of the Jews. Are you with me? It wasn't time to plot and plan and strategize some surreptitious maneuvering. They were terrified. They were scared to death that they were going to be charged with the taking of his body. You don't have a disciples who are on the cutting edge and thinking, now how can we pull this off? The disciples were devastated. They were crushed. Luke chapter 24, the disciples are walking and they're so devastated and crushed. Oh, they were so sad. They were so woebegone that, that Jesus is standing right next to them and they don't recognize him because their mental state precludes them from being able to do that. 
psychologically improbable. It also doesn't take into account what we know about the disciples' moral character. And, and perhaps most of all, again, if they knew it was a conspiracy, then why, pray tell, would they die for what they knew was a lie? The conspiracy theory is absolutely, totally, completely improbable. Not to mention a variety of logistical concerns, like how do a bunch of fishermen overtake those Roman guards who, again, probably look at least a little bit like Travis. I mean, anyone in this room want to take him on? I'm not taking him on. You have all of these logistical problems that arise when you, when you try to cite the conspiracy theory. It lacks explanatory scope. No one's dying for what they know is a lie. Number two, the apparent death theory. This is what most Muslim scholars teach. Jesus didn't die. He swooned. He appeared to have died. He... <sighs> this is medically improbable. Uh, there is an article that I can get for you if you're interested. You can look it up on the internet. Just type in Google J-A-M-A, -A, that's JAMA, Jesus' death. Just type in JAMA, Jesus' death. And there's a marvelous article in there. It's been put out roughly 10 years ago from the Journal of the American Medical Association on the medical evidence that Jesus died. The man, the man hadn't slept, he hadn't eaten, he, he underwent two Roman floggings, and we know historically that people died from the floggings alone at times. And then he was hung on a cross, unquestionable, he was dead before the, pier, the, the spear pierced his side, you can go read about it, it's incredible. Now think about this for just a moment. The idea is, is that he feigned that he died, he went into the tomb, and then the cooler temperatures of the tomb revived him. Okay? Okay? Well, let's think about this. First of all, we have to assume that Jesus would be willing to deceive his disciples. This is inconsistent with what we know about the character of Jesus. Jesus is not a deceiver. Even a historical critic would have to evaluate that the picture that we have of Jesus from history is not one that is consistent with deception. Are you comfortable with that, yes or no? So now we have a deceiving Jesus which is inconsistent with historical record. Then we have a Jesus that is hardly the kind of Jesus that would elicit worship. Coming out of a tomb whipped, beat, flogged, bloodied, fellas, I'm risen from the dead. And the disciples would be thinking, I think he is dead. <laughs> Not exactly the kind of thing that would inspire worship. Maybe medical attention, but not worship. It's not medically consistent. It's inconsistent with what we know about the character of Jesus, and it's inconsistent with the worship. Jesus rose from the dead. The apparent death theory fails. The wrong tomb theory is so silly that it hardly merits response. This idea gained popularity years ago. I don't know. Some, some liberal scholar in the 60s or the 50s said, Oh, the ladies had the wrong tomb. Let's think that through. So the ladies are... In their forlorn, melancholy condition, they come into the garden and they say, Oh! The tomb is empty! He's risen! And they go back. Now, uh, presumably, this news would reach the disciples and especially Joseph of Arimathea, who owned the tomb. Have you ever tried to go into somebody else's house? You thought it was yours? Yeah, me neither. Are you with me? So here comes Joseph, and, and Joseph's in, in the tomb location there, and he, he, he finds the stone, and he, he rolls it back. And he says, oh, he's in there. He's still in there. And he says, oh, the wrong tomb theory? I mean, for real? The tomb location was known, beloved. How are you going to explain the, the empty tomb? Well, they had the wrong tomb. Totally, totally inconsistent with reality. Number four, the mass hallucination theory. This is sort of the theory du jour. I actually read a debate between uh, uh, William Lane Craig and, uh, it's going to come to me here in a moment, Gert Ludeman. And Gert Ludeman is a, a, a proponent of the mass hallucination theory. That the disciples simultaneously hallucinated the same thing. And not just the disciples but 500 people at once on different occasions, in different locations. And this can be utterly shot down for a variety of reasons. First of all, think this through. If they hallucinate that he's raised from the dead, guess what? There's still a body in the tomb. Are you with me, yes or no? So, Jesus is risen. 
And the Jews go and they, they exhume the body and they parade it through the streets of Jerusalem and they say, no, 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 he's not risen. They're hallucinating. Game over. Second thing is, it was inconsistent with Jewish eschatology for Jesus to have been risen. The Jews anticipated a last day resurrection, not a pre-last day resurrection. That's why they couldn't understand the resurrection because for the Jewish mind, the resurrection took place at the last day. And so they wouldn't have imagined that Jesus raised from the dead. What they may have imagined is that he never died. There was no Jewish referent for a resurrection. Maybe that he hadn't died, but not that he'd been raised. And the fact that the tomb still had a body and it is totally inconsistent with the mass hallucination hypothesis. Now, you might be thinking, that's it? That, really? That's it? That's it. Now, now, why would somebody put forth these kinds of ideas instead of the explanation that I happen to believe, and that is that Jesus actually raised from the dead? He even prophesied that such a thing would happen. We read it in Luke chapter 9. And the reason, beloved, that liberal scholars, and please hear me, as a rule deny the resurrection of Jesus is because they deny the existence of the supernatural altogether. So guess what? If there is no supernatural, then there is no resurrection from the dead. And so at the outset, they have already decided that Jesus couldn't have raised from the dead because people don't raise from the dead. That's a supernatural phenomenon that does not transpire. And so their conclusion about why the tomb is empty will be consistent with their premise, which says miracles don't happen. But what if miracles do happen? Then the evidence... The best evidence suggests that the best explanation of the facts is that Jesus rose literally and bodily from the dead. The testimony of the church, Philip Schaff, historian, the Christian church rests on the resurrection of its founder. Without this fact, the church could have never been born, or if born, it would have soon died a natural death. The miracle of the resurrection and the existence of Christianity are so closely connected together that they must stand or fall together. Now, let me explain that to you. In fact, before I do, let me read you this one. If the coming into existence of the Nazarenes, that's the Christians, a phenomenon undeniably attested to by the New Testament, notice this, I love this language, rips a great hole in history, a hole the size and shape of the resurrection, what does the secular historian propose to stop it up with? Hmm. The birth and rapid rise of the Christian church remain, notice this, an unsolved enigma. That is a mystery for any historian who refuses to take seriously the only explanation offered by the church itself, said C.F.D. Mool, Cambridge University. Now, let me explain. This is easy to grasp. If a scientist sees an effect... He or she has to posit a cause that is consistent with the effect. Are you with me, yes or no? So, if this object is here, and we're observing, and then we look away for a moment, and then we look back, and that object is over there. Now, the scientist would look at the effect. He'd say, that piece of paper which weighs this and has this shape and this amount of wind resistance, da, 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 was here and was there. And, and using calculus and bar- various and sundry physical uh, formulas, you could actually determine the, the quantity and, and even the, the, the quality of the, the action that would have nis- brought that thing there from here. No scientist would look at that and say, whoa. The laws of physics have temporarily suspended and that which used to be there has now arrived here with no physical phenomenon that precedes it. No! The scientist sees the effect, sees the what, everyone? And then posits or assumes a sufficient cause to elicit that effect. Make sense? Yes or no? So if that thing's over there, we say, how did it get there? Well, it doesn't need a tank. Okay? We don't need a a, a 350 horsepower car with just a little flick of the wrist. Now think about this. Historians do the same thing. When historians see these great movements in history, they ask the same question that scientists do. They look, at the, they look at the effect, and then they say, what kind of a cause would generate this effect? Are you with me, everyone? Yes or no? And so you, now you... J- just think about the Christian religion. The Christian religion for an outside observer was nothing more than a sect of Judaism. <laughs> and how did the Jews and the Romans get along, beloved? Come on, come on. They get along well? No. In fact, the Jewish religion was religio illicite, that is, illegal religion. 
A Roman could not convert to Judaism. And in the second and third centuries, the persecution got out of hand. The Jews were persecuted furiously at the hands of the Romans. And so think this through now. Now, the Christians didn't meet in churches in the first century. They met in the synagogues with the other Jews. They ate like the other Jews. They dressed like the other Jews. Everything was the same except they believed in this Christ as the Messiah. But to an outside observer, the Christians and the Jews looked to be essentially the same. All that Christianity was was a sect of Judaism to the Roman mind. Are we on the same page, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, now think this through. Here, a sect of Judaism, namely Christianity, becomes the predominant religious political power in the Greco-Roman world in a matter of two centuries, and these people had been worshiping the sun and other pagan deities for hundreds of years, and boom, Christianity explodes on the scene and becomes the powerful predominant force in the Roman world in two centuries. <laughs> Now, a historian is going to say, how'd that happen? How do you get Constantine professing Christianity when Rome has always been pagan? How do you... You look at the effect and then you posit a sufficient cause. How does a sect of Judaism, which was religio illicite, begin to sweep through the world with such power and conviction and even get right to the palace of Caesar itself? That's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, listen, come on, secular historian, explain it. How do you do it? A bunch of uneducated, ragtag, motley crew disciples suddenly decide that this guy rose from the dead, even though they know it's not true? No way. They preach with a conviction and with a power and with a confidence, aided also by the, the outpouring and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. There was such a vital godliness to them that people looked and they said, well, I don't know what these people believe, but I'll bet it's true. And then on top of that, martyr's death, martyr's death, martyr's death, martyr's death. But what was it that Tertullian said? That the, the blood of the martyrs is seed and, and one would die and 10 would pop up and another would die and 20 would pop up and all of a sudden Christianity is just like a cancer in the positive sense, just sweeping through the Greco-Roman world. How'd that happen? You have that kind of radical effect? You better posit a radical cause. And that's why Mr. Mould says, hey, listen, you have a hole in history the size and shape of the resurrection. Now, what's the secular historian going to stop it up with? Fatal torment, empty tomb, appearances in the testimony of the church. I believe that these, the best explanation of these facts is the actual, literal, bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And so I maintain that Jesus is alive, He is risen. He is, this is more than theologically foundational. I believe it is historically factual. Now hang in there for three minutes. Think about Mary. Mary goes into the garden. What's she looking for? She's looking for a corpse. Don't miss this. You hang in there. Mary went to the tomb. She was weeping. She was crushed out. She went looking for a corpse. But you know what she found? She found a risen Savior. That's not what she anticipated. She went to finish the job that they couldn't complete because the Sabbath had come, the, the preparation of the body of Jesus with the spices and the anointing oils. And, and so she goes weeping, not with joy. She goes weeping. She's looking for a cadaver. She's looking for a dead body. She's looking for a corpse. She finds a risen Savior. Amen. Now, beloved... Christ is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. But the Bible is also the Word. Our sermon is entitled, The Word, Alive and Kicking. Jesus is alive, beloved. I don't believe that just because it makes me feel good. I think it's true. But the Bible is also the Word. When you open this book, do you find a corpse? 
Or do you find the living word? It's tough to compete with Mission Impossible 3. The devil ain't no dummy. So you come to this book and it just seems so lifeless by comparison. I mean, come on, where's Tom Cruise in this thing? Beloved, maybe the reason that the Bible seems boring is that we've been pre-programmed by shallow Madison Avenue media culture to see it as boring. Beloved, Mary went looking for a corpse. She didn't find a corpse. She found the risen Lord. Now, what are you looking for when you open your Bible? You think this is a dead book? This book is alive. What does Paul say there in Hebrews? I believe Paul wrote Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Word of God is quick. That word means living. The Word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Beloved, I know this book is true. I have poured my heart out before God. Just opened this book and said, Lord, I need you to speak to me. And look down and read something and have the absolute awareness that God is real. It's a living book. One day I was crying and weeping my heart out. Couldn't sleep. And I don't cry. I'm not a crier. Couldn't sleep. And I... Woke up, went in my office, I began to pray in a sense of my failures as a husband, as a pastor, as a father began to press upon me and I began to cry, began to weep. I'm not a crier and, and I, I was just crying and I felt like I was a total failure in every area of my life and it was pressing upon me and I was thinking, Lord, I got up af- off my knees after 15 or 20 minutes of this and I just said, Lord, I, I need you to, s- to speak to me from your word. I need some encouragement because I'm going to die here. I feel like I'm going to die from my own failures. And I remember sitting up in my office there and, and whenever I'm struggling or, or, or need consolation, I go to the Psalms. That's what I personally do because there's such a, the gamut of emotions is in the Psalms. And so I just opened to Psalms. I just, I just need a word from the Lord. And I, I just opened randomly. And I don't recommend this as a systematic way to study your Bible. But there are times in desperation where you just open and you just need a word from God. And I was crying and I had my sense of failures. And I just opened the Bible to, to Psalms. And I said, Lord, I need you to speak to my heart. And I just randomly opened to Psalm 34 and my eye fell on verse 6. The Bible says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Let me tell you something, beloved. In that moment, God was as real to me in that room as you are real to me in this room. There was an immediate awareness that, that God had spoken. I never miss church. Three, three or four Sabbaths ago, I had to pack to get ready for Sweden because I had a night flight. I don't fly on the Sabbath. I wanted to fly out after the Sabbath. I had to get a lot of things done. And so I did something very unusual, especially for a pastor. I didn't go to church so I could prepare my mind and so I could just kind of get things ready. The family went to church. I stayed home and I I began to feel a little guilty about it, but I just felt like I needed to kind of gather my thoughts before traveling to Sweden. And um, while I'm sitting there on the couch, it's 12 o'clock and I'm studying my Bible. I was studying, I was reading. The mole man pulls up. You say, who's the mole man? In my yard, I got moles. You know what moles are? Yeah, they're an invention of the devil. And these things are just tear, tearing up my yard. And they're not easy to get rid of because what do you... He says, well, we can poison them. Well, I don't want to poison the moles. What if my kids get poisoned? Or what if... Ah, no, we're not poisoning these things. So they have these traps, right? These complicated, weird traps that don't work. <laughs> and, he's, and, the, and the mole man shows up. Oh, I can't believe I didn't tell him I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Ah, it's the Sabbath. He's come to work on the Sabbath. Well, what am I going to do? So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking... Oh, 
Lord, I'll just pretend like I'm not home. But then I thought, can I really do that? And I'm a pastor. Can I pretend like I'm not home? And so I said, well, Lord, just be with me. I walked out there to greet the mole man. Nice guy. I met him once before. Interesting guy. Now you listen to me. And get out there and say, ah, oh, good to see you. I forget his name right now. I think it was Chuck. Or... He's checking the traps. Yeah, no moles in this one. Reaching his finger. Reach your finger down in here. He's out. Yeah, you feel that? It's an active area here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. No, no moles this time, but I'll keep checking the traps and we get to talking. And um, I said, well, man, you know, praise the Lord. Maybe we'll get one of those things. He said, hmm? You a Christian? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. So really? I said, yeah, actually. Believe it or not, I'm a, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and so I wouldn't normally have you working on the Sabbath, but since I didn't tell you, um, hey, I'll just walk around the yard with you. We'll look at these traps. But in the future, it's like, oh, hey, I fully honor that. I honor that. And I understand where you're coming from. And I said, yeah, yeah, you know, praise the Lord. And we got to talking. He said, so you're a Christian, eh? Yeah. You're a minister, eh? Big man. Burly-looking man. I said, yeah. And he said, I used to be a Christian. I said, really? He said, yeah. And then he said, I used to be a Christian minister. Really? He begins to tell me this story. He's a Pentecostal minister. He was one of the best known Pentecostal ministers in the Detroit area. Personal friends with the mayor traveling around and holding Pentecostal revivals. And he was telling me how people would come to his meetings by the hundreds and by the thousands. He became a well-known, listen to what I'm saying now. He became a well-known Pentecostal minister. He was a young man. He was traveling around and he left the ministry. So I say to him, why'd you leave the ministry? And he said, I fell into sin. And I said, really? What's in? And he said, sexual sin. And he looked me right in the eyes and he said, be careful. Beloved, I'm going to tell you something here. I'm one of these people that believes that God can speak through people who aren't Seventh-day Adventists. Are you with me? And at that very moment, I knew God was talking to me. The mole man shows up on the only Sabbath I miss in 10 years almost of being a Seventh-day Adventist. I go outside and the guy used to be a well-known young Pentecostal minister traveling all over, holding large revivals. I'm thinking, hey, that sounds familiar. And then he turns to me and he says, yeah, I, f I fell away. I fell into sin. He fell into sin? What kind of sexual sin? And then he says, you be careful. He said, I was a pastor. I thought I was above temptation. And then he began to talk to me for five, ten minutes, and I just sat there just dish, listening. I'm hearing the voice of God through this man. Beloved, God is alive. Amen. God can speak through a donkey. God can speak through a punk rocker, an ex-punk rock skateboarder. God can speak through a chicken. God can speak through a whale. God, man. But most of all, God speaks through His Word. Amen. Beloved, the resurrection power of the living Christ is available to you today. You say, where is it? It's right here in the pages of the Bible. More exciting than Mission Impossible 3. It's right in the Word, beloved. Does the Word need to be resurrected in your life? Education, page 126. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. Wow. This Word imparts power and it begets life. Every command is a promise accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. It's in the Bible, beloved. Now, i got a question for you tonight. The Word alive and kicking, that's our sermon. Jesus is alive. That's a historical fact. Beloved, the Bible is alive. And I want to know if that's a personal fact. I don't know about you. I don't know your life. 
I don't know your priorities. I don't know much. But I'm going to venture a guess. I'm going to hazard a guess that you come to a conference like this and you want more of God in your experience. Is that a safe guess, yes or no? Now, I don't know what's been taking your time. But if the Bible seems dead, if the Bible seems boring and unalive, it might be that we don't have time to sit and listen to what God has to say. Christ is risen from the dead. But is the Bible resurrected in our lives? Or is the Internet more important? Is the Oilers game more important? Now, beloved, you listen to me. You watch the Oilers game all you want, but just be sure you're having your devotions too. Are you with me? Is the television more important? Beloved, we need a resurrection of an appreciation of God's Word. I need it. I need it in my life. Do you need it? I'm just wondering if there's someone here this evening who, uh, who needs that kind of a resurrection of the power of God's Word in their life. Start making time for the Word. And you want to say, you know, there, there have been some distractions, but uh, Father, I need the living Word. I'm going to be so bold as to invite you to come forward and make a decision. No songs. I'm not going to sing a pretty song. That's too easy. I'll get you to come forward just like that. I just want to know if there's somebody who's going to come here and kneel down with me and say, I need a resurrection. Kneel down with me here of the living word in my life. There's lots of room. You need to come. There's lots of room. And don't do that thing where you just crowd up the aisles. Come right forward. There's lots of room up here. Come on up. You need a resurrection of the living word. You can come around the sides. You can come up on the platform. I need it. I really do. Let's pray. Oh, God in heaven, we believe that Jesus is alive. Amen. Father, we want that to be more than a historical fact. We need the living Christ in our life. And Father Christ is trying to sneak in, but it's hard to fit it. He's finding it hard to fit into our busy schedule. After all, we're young and we're busy and, and we've got things to do. And, but Father, we give you permission to arrest our attention so that the living Christ and His living Word can have a proper place in our lives. Father, we want to confess that we have come to your Word many times looking for a corpse, expecting to be bored and yet finding there the risen Christ Father we need to find that the creative energy that brought the worlds into existence is in your word and Father we need a dose of that we need a change of priorities some of us we need to refocus we need to recalibrate some of us we need to set things right and divorce ourselves from the culture of Christianity and get back into the cause and the Christ of Christianity. Father, these young people have come forward. I don't know them all, but you do. You know how many hairs are on the heads of every person here. Father, we've come forward. We've knelt before you because we need the living word in our lives. So, O oh God in heaven, don't disappoint us, and we don't think you will. As we commit to you, may you commit to us. We claim the promise of Malachi, return to me, 
and I will return to you, saith the Lord. So, Father, here we are. Here are our priorities. We lay them before you. Mold them. Fashion them. And give them back to us with your word and the living Christ at the top of the list. Father, we know that doesn't mean we can't have fun. We know that doesn't mean we can't have a joy-filled life. Father, we want to have a Christ-centered life. So give us an experience with your word. Father, you are the living God. Your Son is the living Christ. Now come be real in your word and in our lives. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen. This media was produced by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www. Dot hopevideo.com. Our address is Hope Media Ministry, P.O. Box 752, Ada, Michigan 49301. You can also email us at hope at hopevideo.com. Our media includes DVD, video, CD audio, and cassette. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.com That's hopevideo.com